Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the second talk of the lecture series on Boolean function analysis. Um, today, uh, we are pleased to have a fantastic uh, talk uh, with uh, two speakers, uh, Hao Hang and uh, our Avishai Tal. Um, so Hao uh, got his PhD uh, from, the, from UCLA and uh, he has held postdoctoral positions at IAS, um, and uh, University of Minnesota, University of UMN, and uh, he's now a currently a tenure track faculty at e uh, Emory University. Uh, how uh, he found an ingenious and surprising proof of uh, a long-standing, one of the long, lo biggest open questions in Boolean function analysis uh, last year. And today we'll hear about the proof. And in the second half of the talk, uh, we'll have uh, Avishai Tal uh, will tell us about its applications uh, to query complexity and some of his recent work on uh, quantum query complexity and deterministic query complexity. Uh, and uh, uh, before we start the talk, uh, there's a Discord channel which is um, uh, which one could use for, to, for discussions and questions. Also the question answer stream on the um, uh, on, on Zoom, uh, we'll be looking at questions there. Uh, so please uh, write down all your questions that you might have there. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the there's a mailing list that we have created uh, for reminders for this uh, talk series. Uh, we will, uh, um, if you'd like to be added to that mailing list, we'll send out an email to this uh, af afternoon to everyone who's uh, attending the talk today. And uh, you could just add yourself to the mailing list that way. All right, so let's start. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank Prasa and Abhishek for organizing this great workshop and inviting me to speak in it. So today I'm going to talk about basically the background motivation and the proof of the conjecture. And I think the second part of the talk, Abhishek will talk about some recent applications. So I guess we, the name of the workshop is about Boolean functions. So we're all familiar with the definition of it. If not, let me mention this one more time. So a Boolean function is just a function that maps uh, n-dimensional binary string to zero or one. So here we introduce the definition of sensitivity. So first we do it locally. So what's the local sensitivity of a Boolean function f on the input x? So here, x is just a given uh, n-dimensional binary string. f is a given Boolean function. So we just want to count the number of coordinates i such that f of x is not equal to f of x i. So here, the notation x i means we flip the i's coordinate of x. So basically, we want to count a given point x, how many coordinates we could change such that it changes the value of the function f at this point. And the sensitivity of this Boolean function is just defined as the maximum local sensitivity. So here, the maximum is taken over all the n-dimensional binary strings. So let's see a very easy example, the end function in n variables. So it outputs one if all the inputs are equal to one, and outputs zero if any one input is equal to zero. So here, for simplicity, I don't want to discuss the trivial case when n is equal to one, so I always assume n is large. Now, what's the sensitivity of f at the zero input? So, okay, so f of zero is equal to zero, but if you change any one coordinate from zero to one, you still get zero, right? So no coordinate is sensitive at this input. So the sensitivity is equal to zero. And on the other hand, if you look at the all one input, the sensitivity is equal to one because for all one vector is mapped to one. But even, I mean, even if you change one coordinate from one to zero, it's mapped to zero now. Okay, so now what's the sensitivity, the global sensitivity of this end function? So it's equal to the maximum, but obviously it cannot exceed the number of variables n. So it's equal to n exactly. So I hope this example is good enough for this definition of sensitivity. So let me move on to a different concept called the block sensitivity. So these two slides look pretty similar, but they are two, two, actually two different slides. So what's the local block sensitivity first? So instead of flipping one coordinate at a time, now we would like to flip a block of coordinates. So here a block just means a subset of coordinates. So it doesn't have to be consecutive coordinates. 
So now for a fixed input X, we'd like to maximize the number of distribution subsets B1, B2 up to VK, such that if you flip the entire subset BI, this changes the value of F. And similarly, we just define the global block sensitivity as the maximum local block sensitivity. So again, let's look at the end function. Now you can see it looks all similar. So for the all one input, the answer is N because if you change any bit, the value is changed from one to zero. But now for the all zero input, actually the block sensitivity, local block sensitivity is equal to one because you can change the entire N, N coordinates and the value now changes. And so what's the global block sensitivity? It's still equal to N because it's the maximum and it cannot exceed N. Now from this, uh, examples, you can already see that the block sensitivity is always greater or equal to the sensitivity. Why? Because if you fix the input X, then if you have, let's say, T coordinates that are sensitive, you can always take these T coordinates as the blocks in the definition of the local block sensitivity. So the local block sensitivity is always greater or equal to the local sensitivity. And when you maximize it, you still have the inequality. But at this moment, we have seen only the n function. And if you do the all function, you can see that also the sensitivity and the block sensitivity are both equal to n. If you play with some small examples, you see that it seems that they're always equal. But as you do, do we really need to introduce two different definitions? Are they always equal? Of course, the answer is no, right? That's why they have different names. And let me show you a function such that the block sensitivity is strictly greater than the sensitivity. And this is a famous Rubinstein function. So now let me define a Boolean function f in n squared variables. So n is a positive integer. So you can think of it in this way. So you have n rows and n columns. So they are n squared variables. And let me call this x i j. So i and j runs from one to n. So first of all, for every row, I define a function g in this way. So if you have the first and the second coordinate to be both equal to one and the rest of the coordinates to be zero, or if you have the second and the third coordinate to be one and the other coordinates to be zero, or et cetera, then g outputs one. So, okay, so g outputs one if and only if you see two consecutive coordinates gives, that gives you one and the rest are zero. And now for every row, you apply the g function. And after you get output from every row, then you pay the all function. Now I claim that the block sensitivity of this Boolean function, the Rubinstein function, is at least quadratic in F. Why is that? So for example, let's take a look at this four by four case. So let's only focus on the input zero, the all zero vector. So if everything is zero, then of course G output is zero. So every row of zero, and if you take the all function, it still gives you zero. Now, if you just change the first two coordinates from the first row from zero to one, then the first row should output one, right, by the definition of G. Now, once you see a one in one of the rows, then you must see a one in the final output. So changing these two coordinates from zero to one changes the value of F. But similarly, you can keep these two coordinates to be zero and you change the next two coordinates, or you can change the, these two coordinates on the second row and so on. So basically, for the zero input, you can find roughly n squared over two blocks, so such that they are distributed and all of them are sensitive. So the block sensitivity is at least roughly n squared over two. Now, on the other hand, we can show that the sensitivity is at most linear in n. Why is that? So let's discuss two different cases, uh, the, at the zero input and the one input. So I just saw a question. So uh, does J in the Rubinstein function need to be unique or there could be multiple such consecutive? So there cannot be multiple such J because let's go back to the definition because we need these two coordinates to be one and the rest to be zero. But of course on different rows, you can have different different J's. Okay, so now let me move on to the sensitivity. So at the zero input, so now because we are taking the all function over the row, so we know that every row must output zero. And now 
I'm claiming that uh, for every row, there are at most two sensitive coordinates. That's because in the worst case, you have a binary string like this. You have one coordinate is equal to one and the rest equal to zero. So if you change this coordinate to, to its left or this coordinate to its right, then it changes the value of this function. So every row has at most two sensitive coordinates and there are only n rows. So there are at most two times n sensitive coordinates. So the local sensitivity of f at this uh, input x is at most two times n. Now let's look at the x where f of x is equal to one. So if we are very lucky to have already at least two rows that outputs one, then we can immediately conclude that the, sensi the local sensitivity at this input is equal to zero. Because when you can only change one coordinate, it will only change at most one, at most the output of one row. So it will not affect the event, eventual value of your function. Okay, so the sensitivity, local sensitivity in this case is equal to zero. And on the other hand, if you have only one row that outputs one, so you can see the other rows doesn't matter, right? You cannot have any sensitive coordinates from the other rows. So even if this row has every coordinate to be sensitive, you get at most n sensitive coordinates. So in this case, you get a local sensitivity to be at most n. So in both cases, you have a linear upper bound. So, okay, so let me quickly summarize this. So we know that for every Boolean function f, the sensitivity is bounded from above by the block sensitivity. And this Rubinstein's example shows that there exists a Boolean function f such that its block sensitivity is quadratic in the sensitivity. So does block sensitivity depend on the number of blocks? No, I mean, there are some definition of, about K block sensitivities and so on. But, but here, I mean, you can take this number of blocks to be arbitrary. All right, so, so we have a sensitivity, the definition of sensitivity and, sorry, and block sensitivity. And so isn't this a zero input for Boolean in a table, a zero input for Rubinstein function? Let's see, okay, so yeah, so every row outputs zero, yes. And now if you change uh, one row from, right, but, but there's no sensitive coordinate in this case, I guess. You see, because um, if you change the first zero to one, then I mean, it's the first row still output zero. I mean, there's no, the, the, the local sensitivity is equal to zero for this input. Okay, so as I said, we know that sensitivity is at most the block sensitivity and block sensitivity could be quality and sensitivity in some cases. And there was this beautiful conjecture of Nisa and Segetic in 1992. They asked, is it true that for every Boolean function f, the block sensitivity is bounded from above by sensitivity to the power of c for some positive constant c. And now you may ask the following question. So, I mean, the sensitivity is definitely a very natural concept for measuring the complexity of a Boolean function. So for example, if instead of looking at the sensitivity, you, instead of taking the maximum local sensitivity, you look at the average local sensitivity, then this is the influence that, the total influence that you may have heard from the previous lectures. But why do we even care about the block sensitivity? So it looks like such an unnatural notion. And the reason is because, so actually the block sensitivity is closely related to a lot of other complexity measures of Boolean functions that uh, theoretical computer scientists care about. So to state this properly, let me first define what does it mean for two complexity measures to be polynomially related. So it just means that you can just bound, uh, let's say for every Boolean function, S1 applied on F is always greater or equal to S2 applied on F to the some positive power as bounded from above by S2 of F to some positive power as well. So if a function is complicated in one measure, then it has to be complicated as well in the other measure. So it has been long known that the following list of complexity measures of Boolean functions are all polynomially related. So this includes the block sensitivity we just discussed and the deterministic decision tree complexity, certificate complexity, 
So let me say a little bit about what the degree is because that's the notion that I'm going to use later. So for every Boolean function, there is a unique way of writing it as a multilinear polynomial. And the degree of that real multilinear polynomial is just the degree of this Boolean function. So for example, you can check that the n function and O function and variables both have degree n. And there's also another notion called the approximate degree of n. And there's this randomized version and quantum version of query complexity. So, I mean, we know all of them polynomial related. We haven't determined all the best constant we can get in these polynomial relations. But the main outstanding problem in this field before 2019 was, is the sensitivity also, does the sensitivity also belong to this list? And so a sensitivity conjecture basically says that, well, if true, it, this sensitivity will cease to be outlier and joins a large and heavy flock according to coherence. But there are also some other uh, aspect of the sensitivity conjecture. So in some sense, we can view the sensitivity as a measure of how smooth a Boolean function is with respect to the Hamming term. So in other words, if you have a function which has low sensitivity, it means with respect to the Hamming distance, it's more smooth. So if the sensitivity conjecture is true, then it just tells you that uh, computationally, if you have a smooth or low sensitivity function, then it's easy to compute in some of the computational models like determinist decision tree model. And mathematically, it's also interesting because you can argue that a low sensitivity function or smooth function should have low algebraic degree. Okay, so now what's, what, 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 what do we know about this sensitivity conjecture? So here I list all the results before June 2019. And so the first list is about upper bounds on the block sensitivity. And the second list is about the best construction we know separating these two complexity measures. So Simon in 1983 proved the upper bound, which is essentially four to the power of the sensitivity. And in 2004, Kenya and Kutin improved this constant four to E. And then it was, this constant was later improved to by Ambainis, Bavarian, Gao, Mao, Sun, and Zhou in 2013 to two. But if you look at all these mouse, they are all exponential in the sensitivity. And for the separations, for Rubin's time function, if you do the calculation carefully, you see the block sensitivity is equal to half times the sensitivity square. And so here, if you care about, I mean, if you carefully play with the parity of n, then you will be able to get a construction by visa in 2011. So improve this by linear term. And then Ambani and in 2011 introduced a different uh, construction and improve the constant factor from one half to two third. So basically all the bounds are exponential and all the separations are quadratic. So now let me mention the real reason that I got into this business of sensitivity conjecture. That's because there's a, so I'm a combinatorist and we, that's because uh, of a extremely beautiful correspondence established by Grossman Linear in 1992. So they proved the following. So the, these two statements are equivalent for any monotone function H. So the first statement is, now let's consider QN. So QN is an n-dimensional hypercube graph. So the definition is the following. So the vertices are all the n-dimensional binary strings, or you can think of them as subsets of one to n. So two vertices are adjacent if and only if these two strings or two vectors differ in exactly one coordinate. So for example, when n is equal to one, you just get a single edge, kick a, or you can break on two vertices. And when n is equal to two, you get a cycle of length four. And when a is equal to three, that's the cube that we're all familiar with. Okay, so now the first statement is uh, for every induced subgraph H of the n dimensional hypercube graph, uh, such that it does not contain exactly half the vertices. Okay, so basically here we are looking at a partition of the vertices of QN, and this partition cannot be balanced. This means we cannot have exactly half on one side and half on the other side. So now what we're interested in is the maximum degree of the induced subgraph QN on H. 
and the induced subgraph on H complement. Now, if we can always guarantee that the mass, one of these maximum degree is greater or equal to a function in the dimension of the hypercube, then we can immediately conclude that for every Boolean function f, its sensitivity is greater or equal to h of the degree of f. And these two are actually equivalent. Okay, so let's see why this is related to a sensitivity conjecture. So suppose we can prove the statement one for a function h, which is n to the c for some part of positive c. Then it implies that for every Boolean function, the sensitivity is greater or equal to the degree to the c power. But we already know that the degree and the block sensitivity and a bunch of other complexity measures are all polynomially related. And the sensitivity is already great, or it's already less or equal to the block sensitivity. Then from this second statement, we, we immediately know that sensitivity is also polynomially related to the other complexity measures. And let me spend maybe five minutes to explain the proof of this Gossman, so there's some misspelling here, Gossman linear correspondence. So basically they introduce an intermediate statement, let me call this three. So instead of looking at all the Boolean functions, they only look at the Boolean functions of degree n, where n is the number of variables. And now, so they can show that one, two, three are all equivalent. But since we only care about like how to prove the sensitivity conjecture, so we just need to use the direction from one to two. And the way it works is you prove one in price three in price two. Okay. Okay, so now let me uh, explain the most difficult step in this proof, one in price three. So we like to show that if we have a function h bounding this maximum of the maximum degree in the hypercube, then we have a up, we have a inequality about Boolean functions of full degree. Okay, so now let's prove it by contradiction. Suppose three doesn't hold. It means that we can find a Boolean function g such that it has full degree and the sensitivity is smaller than h of n. So here we can assume that the Boolean function is uh, maps 0, 1 to the n to minus 1, 1 instead of 0, 1. So it doesn't really change the nature of the problem. Okay, so now let's introduce a Boolean function, P of S, called the parity function. So basically you just count the sum of the coordinates and check whether it's even or odd. So now with this Boolean function, we could define a subset of vertices of the hypercube. Let me call this H. And, and the, this subset of vertices consists of those X such that G of X times P of X is equal to one. So basically you multiply the parity function with the current Boolean function. And you take those that gives you one and take those gives you minus one to form this partition. So now one can easily check that the sensitivity of the Boolean function is equal to the maximum of this maximum degree. This, following, this follows from the definition. And what's more interesting is if you um, count the number of vertices in H minus the number of vertices in H complement, so you can see this exactly equal to the expected value of G times P, just from the definition. And by Fourier transform, this is equal to the Fourier transform of G times P evaluated on the empty set, and this is equal to G half N. And you can see that this has to be non-zero because G has full degree. Okay, so what does this imply? So we just get an unbalanced partition H, H bar, and such that the maximum of this maximum degrees of induced subgon H and H bar is strictly smaller than H of N. So this will violate statement one. So it just finished the proof that one implies three. And for three, three implies two, as a simple exercise, there's essentially only one way to prove it, so I'd rather leave it to you. Okay, so with the Gaussman linear correspondence, so we already know that if we can prove some purely combinatorial result on the hypercube, then we can possibly settle the sensitivity conjecture. But here the problem looks a bit complicated because we have to look at an unbalanced partition and we look at two subgraphs. And it's difficult, I mean, at least for me to simultaneously consider two induced subgraphs. 
And I mean, if to count the number of edges might still be doable, but we can see the maximum degree of two different subgraphs seems impossible. So why don't we just look at one subgraph? And of course, the natural uh, object here is to look at the larger subgraph, right? Because if you have an unbalanced partition, so one of them needs to have size at least two to the n minus one plus one. So is it true that as long as we take one more vertex than half, then we can already have the maximum degree of the induced subgraph to be at least some n to the c. Okay, let's play with some small examples. So here I did not draw the two dimensional case, but you see if we have a cycle of length four, and if we only take two vertices, then we can have an empty induced subgraph, right? But as long as we take three vertices, then we must have a, so basically a path of length two. So it has a vertex of degree two. Okay, and now let's move on to the three dimensional case. So there are eight vertices. So if you take all the even vertices, and let's say we take one odd vertex, then this gives you the odd vertex has degree three, which is not very good for us, right? Because we, we basically want to minimize the maximum degree. But there's a different way of taking five vertices here. So we can take all these red vertices so in the graph, so in this, in this figure, and then the induced subgraph is a path of length four. So every vertex has degree m of two. So now, I mean, we can easily prove that this is the best you can do, but let's move on to the four dimensional case. There are already too many cases to be checked by hand, but I mean, the computer can handle like 16 to nine perfectly well. So if you list all the possibilities and in the end, it will tell you that there exists a way of choosing nine vertices such that the induced subgraph has maximum degree two. So it might not be easy to see uh, what did this nine vertices gives, but let me show this induced subgraph to you. So basically, it, the induced subgraph has one isolated vertex here and a cycle of length eight. So every vertex has maximum degree, so it has degree at most two. And again, that's the best you could do. And I mean, the computer can still handle the next case, this 32 to 17, and the answer becomes three now. So, okay, so. Let's say you define a sequence of numbers. So A2 is equal to two, A3 is equal to two, A4 is equal to two, A5 is equal to three. And then what's your guess? So it should be square root of M, right? And actually Chang, Freddy, Graham, and Seymour in 1988, they prove upper bound, meaning that in an M-dimensional hypercube graph, one could find one more vertex than half, such that the maximum degree of the induced subgraph is square root of M. And the construction is the following. So I don't want to explain in details why this works, but if you are familiar with this M of all function, then it basically tells you that you just uh, multiply this M of all function with the Boolean function with the parity function. And that's the construction for, the, for, for, for this induced subgraph. Okay. And on the other hand, they could show that uh, no matter which two to the n minus one plus one vertex induced subgraph you choose, the maximum degree is at least log n. So now here from these two theorems, you see some very familiar things, right? In the first one, there's a quadratic separation that comes from an example. And in the second one, you have an exponential upper bound. So if you still remember the Gaussman linear correspondence, so the second result basically says that the, there's an exponential inequality relating the degree and the sensitivity. And the first one uh, does not precisely correspond to a Rubinstein function. It actually says that if you take this n of of or all of n function, then there's a quadratic separation between the degree and the sensitivity. Okay. So let me here briefly mention how they prove this uh, log and lower bound. So it's like they look, they use isoperimetric inequality on the hypercube and do some clever double countings. And it turns out that we can actually improve this lower bound from log n to square root of n, which would uh, prove the sensitivity conjecture. So we can actually get a very tight bound, which uh, coincide with the construction they have, which that, that comes from this n of all function. So we saw that for every two to the n minus one plus one vertex induced subgraph, the maximum degree is at least root n. And from the Gaussman linear correspondence, this gives you the sensitivity is at least square root of the degree. 
And now if you care about the sensitivity versus block sensitivity in the original uh, Nissan Sagetti conjecture, then the, you can uh, use this polynomial relations between the block sensitivity and degree. So Nissan Sagetti in 92, so the block sensitivity is bounded from above by two times the square of the degree. Then I will say improve this to the square of the degree. And recently, I, uh, I think a graduate student at MIT, Jake Warrens, improve this constant further to square root of two over three. So now you can conclude that the broad sensitivity is at most, I think uh, two over three times the degree to the, uh, times the sensitivity to the fourth power. Okay. Okay, so now let me uh, quickly describe the proof. So it's not quite uh, frequent that you can give a, in a full proof in a one hour talk. So the first idea is, instead of looking at the maximum degree of the induced subgraph, we could consider the largest eigenvalue. And what's the motivation of considering the largest eigenvalue? Okay, so to bound the maximum degree, so the most natural way is, can we actually bound the average degree of the induced subgraph? But if you spend two minutes on this, you could quickly see that it doesn't work, right? So for example, if you take all the even vertices, and just one odd vertex. Then what does the induced subgraph look like? So you have the odd vertex adjacent to n even vertices. And you also have a lot of isolated vertices. So essentially you get a star with n edges. So what's the largest degree of a star? It's n, which is good for us. And But the average degree of this induced subgraph is something like n over two to the n. Right, because there are only n edges and there's just so many vertices. So the average degree is actually very small. So we cannot expect to bound the average degree from below by n to the c. But of course you can try to, let's say, take the sum of the square of the degrees or maybe even the cubic power and so on. And then this naturally leads you to look at something about the spectral norm of the adjacency matrix. So it turns out that uh, the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of the graph G. So let me here briefly mention what adjacency matrix is. So for every n vertex undirected graph, we can define an n by n matrix in the following way. So every row and column corresponds to a vertex of G. And you put uh, n G to be one if these two vertices are adjacent and you make it zero if they're not adjacent. So it's a symmetric n by n matrix so all the eigenvalues are real. And you can look at the largest eigenvalue, which is lambda one. And it turns out that lambda one is actually between the maximum degree and the average degree. And now if you look back at this example of taking all the even vertices and just one old vertex, you can calculate that the largest eigenvalue is equal to square root, which is still good for us. And if you're thinking a little bit more, you will actually see that the largest eigenvalue is always polynomially related to the maximum degree. Why is that? Okay, let's start from the easier direction, the upper bound. So we take the largest eigenvalue lambda one and we look at an uh, eigenvector V of it. And let's just uh, assume that VI is the coordinate which has the largest eigenvalue, at uh, largest absolute value. Now, by definition, we have lambda one times vi is equal to the i's coordinate of the adjacency matrix of g times v. So what does, what, what does this look like? So this is equal to the sum of vj for those vertices j adjacent to i. Now we can apply the triangle inequality. So this sum is bounded from above by the number of coordinates in both here, which is the, mass, the, the, the degree of j, which is bounded from above by the maximum degree times the upper bound on the absolute value of vj. So here you can pay this to be the absolute value of vi because we already assume vi gives you the largest one. Okay, so these two things cancels, then you get lambda one is less or equal to the maximum degree. And the other bound is also not super difficult to get. So uh, you can actually delete edges one by one. So there's one, way of uh, defining the largest eigenvalue from the Rayleigh quotient. So basically the largest eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix is equal to S transpose times the matrix times X, uh, maximized over all the uh, unit vectors. 
So now once you, you remove the edges, this maximum can only go down. So now you just delete all the edges not adjacent to the vertex, vertex of the largest degree. And in the end, you just get basically a, a star of degree delta. And the eigenvalue of this star is equal to, so the largest minus square root of delta and the smallest minus minus square root of de delta and the bounds of zero. So in other words, it tells you that before removing all these edges, not incident to the vertex of maximum degree, the eigenvalue lambda one has to be greater or equal to square root of the maximum degree. Okay, so we know that these two notions are polynomial related. It means that if we would like to use the Gaussman linear correspondence to establish the sensitivity conjecture, we really have to show that the largest eigenvalue has, is always greater or equal to n to the c. And is again, the, the dimension of the Q. And there's one more advantage of using the eigenvalue instead of the maximum degree. So because eigenvalue has a very nice interlacing property. So there's this theorem by Cauchy called the Cauchy's interlace theorem. So you have two matrices A and B. So A is an N by N symmetric matrix and B is just a principal submatrix of A, meaning that if you take the third, fifth and sixth row, then you also take the third, fifth and sixth column and look at the three by three matrix it formed. Now let's list all the eigenvalues of A in the descending order and eigenvalues of B in descending order. Then you have the following inequality. So mu i is less or equal to lambda i, mu i is greater or equal to lambda i plus n minus m. So as I always said, uh, I cannot really memorize the exact form of this inequality, but it's easier to think in this way. So if you look at the i's largest eigenvalue of the smaller matrix, it's bounded from above by the i's largest eigenvalue of the bigger matrix. If you look at the j smallest eigenvalue of the smaller matrix, is bounded from below by the j smallest eigenvalue of the uh, larger matrix. Okay. I mean, you just need to prove one and the other one follows by multiply the matrix by minus one. Right? And so here, let me mention something irrelevant to the conjecture, but it's something that motivates uh, our use of this interlacing method. So from the Cauchy's interlace theorem, we can already get that the independence number of any graph. So here the independence number is defined as the maximum number of vertices in your graph such that these vertices are pairwise non-adjacent. So we have the following called inertial bound on the independence number. That's less or equal to the number of non-negative eigenvalues of this adjacency matrix. It's also less or equal to the number of non-positive eigenvalues of this adjacency matrix. And there are some beautiful applications of this inertial bound. For example, if you notice know this Corrado theorem in Shimoset theory, you just directly construct the graph as adjacency matrix and apply this bound, and it will prove the theorem. All right, then why don't we do the same for our problem? So let's just take the hypercube graph. So the hypercube graph, again, let me remind you what is this. So in the one dimensional case, you just have an edge. In the two-dimensional case, it's a four cycle. In the three-dimensional case, it's just the Q. So it, we can calculate the eigenvalue of QN. I think that's a well-known result in the literature. So it has N distinct, uh, sorry, N plus one distinct eigenvalues. N, N minus two, N minus four, N minus six, all the way down to minus N. So every time you jump by two. And the multiplicity of these eigenvalues are n to 0, n to 1, n to 2, n to i, n to i, n to n. So it's not so surprising to see that the sum of the, all these binomial coefficients is equal to 2 to the n, which is the number of vertices. Right? OK, so now let's try to apply this Cauchy's interlace theorem directly. So recall that we are interested in bounding the maximum degree of a 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 vertex induced subgraph of the cube. And we already said that we would like to study the largest eigenvalue instead of a maximum degree. So from the Cauchy's interlace theorem, we have a lower bound on lambda one of H, which comes from the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue of the original hypercube graph. Okay, so if we look at this list of eigenvalues, you can see this is not very good for us because you have n, n minus two, and in the middle, you get maybe either zero or one. 
So this only gives a lower bound that the largest eigenvalue of this induced subcore is at least zero or one. Okay, so we know that the massive degree is at least zero or one, but that's trivial, right? Because the independence number of that, of the hypercube graph is only two to the n minus one. So it doesn't tell us anything interesting. However, if you look at this more carefully, you can see that if we relax the, our assumption on the number of vertices a little bit, if we allow to have one half plus C times two to the N vertices, so slightly more than half, then the maximum degree is already greater or equal to C prime times square root of F. Just by, I mean, you can check just by these properties of this binomial coefficient, or you can say the trail of one. I guess it's also, you already mentioned that there's a lower bound of log n, right? So, so. there's a lower bound, which is linear in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this is the best you can get, but it's the not, not the way you get free from the interlacing. Yeah. I'm saying like one is is inferior to the lower bound. Of yes, it's inferior, but it's, you see, there's still some potential of using this yeah. method. That's the point. Yeah, thanks. All right, so we know that taking the adjacency matrix of QM doesn't work here. But why don't we choose a different type of adjacency matrix? So in extreme combinatorics, uh, whenever you need to prove upper bound the independence number, you can take the adjacency matrix directly and try to apply either the inertial bound or there's something else called the Hoffman bound, or you can look at the lower theta function and so on. But usually for those problems, you can you are also allowed to change the non-zero entries of your adjacency matrix. So here we can use a similar idea. So instead of taking a, a usual adjacency matrix of the cube graph, we can take something called a side adjacency matrix of the cube. So what I mean by side adjacency matrix, so it means that I keep the zero entry and I can change the one entry to either one or minus one. But here I need to maintain that the matrix is still symmetric, otherwise the Cauchy's interlace theorem might not work, or you might not even have uh, all the eigenvalues to be uh, real. Okay, it turns out that if you have a graph and you take a so-called symmetric side adjacency matrix of it, then you still have the same inequality. The largest eigenvalue is still a lower bound on the maximum degree. And the proof is just the same as before. Actually, in the previous proof, I don't even need to take a lot of absolute values. And the reason that I wrote it in that way is to make sure that it works here. Okay, so now this means if we can find a side signing of the adjacency matrix of the cube, such that the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue is equal to square root of n, then we are done. We just apply the previous inequality, the largest eigenvalue of the induced subgroup is greater or equal to the largest eigenvalue of the side adjacency matrix. Uh, and and this in the relation is greater or equal to this two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue of the entire side adjacency matrix, which is square root of n. Now the question is, does there exist such a nice side adjacency matrix? And the answer is yes. So, uh, let's look at the simplest case. So for the one dimensional case, there's not too much choices, right? I mean, you can, you can either put 0, 1, 1, 0, or 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, but they are the same. That's because if you flip the signing on all the edges incident to a vertex, that does not change the eigenvalue of the defined adjacency matrix. And now let's try, but let's try to do it, define this recursively. And for the next case, we will make some change. So instead of having a positive signing on every edge, we only have positive signs on three edges and one negative sign on the, this one remaining edge. And in the next case, there's something very similar, but on the, so we have two sub -cues. On the first sub -cue, we just use whatever we have from the n minus one dimensional k. And for the bottom sub -cue, we just try, uh, flip this signing and for the vertical edges, we always take the positive sign. So if you write this in the linear algebra language, the side adjacency matrix just defines as this MA is equal to this two by two blocks MN minus one here, identity matrix, identity matrix minus MN minus one. So basically these two identity matrix corresponds to the vertical edges and these two corresponds to the signing on the top and the bottom cube. Okay, so now we can show that if you square this matrix MN, then by a little bit of calculation, this is exactly equal to N times identity matrix. 
So in other words, you have a symmetric matrix whose square is equal to n times i. So you know that all the eigenvalue has to be either square root of n or minus square root of n. But by the definition of this matrix, the diagonal entries are all zero. So the trace of this matrix is zero, which means the sum of the eigenvalues has to be zero as well. So if you have a bunch of square root of n and minus square root of n whose sum is equal to zero, then the, the numbers should match. Right? So they're exactly two to the n minus one square root of n and two to the n minus one minus square root of n. And this is exactly what we look for earlier. Okay, so that basically concludes the proof of the sensitivity conjecture. But let me mention a little bit. Uh, so since uh, the paper is out, many people ask uh, what happens about the signing? Is there anything unique about it? Can we choose a different signing? And the answer is yes and no. Um, so let, let me, but, but I can actually give you a characterization of all the signings that work here. And also that explains to you why we only take plus minus one instead of taking other numbers, let's say between minus one and one. So there's this Hadamas inequality in linear algebra. It says that if you take an M by M uh, matrix, I don't think here you need this to be symmetric, then the determinant of this matrix has its absolute value bounded from above by the product of the length of the row. And I mean, it's easier to understand it geometrically. So it just says that the volume is less or equal to the product of the side lengths. And from there, it's not so difficult to see that equality is achieved if and only if all the row vectors are pairwise orthogonal. OK, let's try to recall what we need for this signed adjacency matrix M. So first of all, it has to be a signed adjacency matrix, meaning that so, okay, so what's the usual adjacency matrix of QN? So there are two to the N rows and columns. And on every row or column, you see N1 and the rest are zero. So if you take a side adjacency matrix, then the length of this row has to be um, exactly square root of N. Right? I mean, even if you are allowed to take some number between minus one and one, the lengths are bounded from above by square root of N. So by Hadamas inequality, the determinant is bounded from above by square root of n to the power of two to the n. And on the other hand, we really want the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue to be large. Let's say if we would like to get a tight result, we need this to be at least square root of n. So how does the eigenvalues behave? So in graph theory, one of the most well-known results is if you take a bipartite graph, then the eigenvalue of this adjacency matrix is symmetric about zero, meaning that if you have lambda as an eigenvalue, then minus lambda is also an eigenvalue. So here, if you take a side symmetric matrix, a side uh, adjacency matrix of the bipartite graph, this hypercube, then you still have the same property. So you have two to the n eigenvalues, two to the n minus one of them are positive, uh, maybe not negative, and two to the n minus of the, one of them are negative. And you need a two to the n minus one's largest one to be at least square root of n. So the only possibility is the po all the positive ones are at least square root of n, and all the negative ones are at most minus square root of n. So all the absolute values are at least square root of n. So if you, so, okay, so the determinant is equal to the product of the eigenvalues. So it has to be at least square root of n to the power of two to the n. So, okay, so we need this Hadamas inequality to be sharp. In other words, we, we need that all the row vectors are pairwise orthogonal. So we need m transpose times n to be this, this identity matrix times n. Now you can do a little bit of calculation. So you write this as two by two plot. So this corresponds to a, m, a minus one dimensional sub q. C corresponds to the other sub q. And k has to be a diagonal matrix with signs. And then do a little bit of calculation. In the end, it turns out that the signing K and B will uniquely determine C. And so if you take K to be all positive, then this is exactly how we define this earlier. Okay. And I mean, this will give you all the possible signings. And in the end, I think you will see that all the, so there's only a one signing up to it's also if you allow to change all the size of edges incident to a vertex simultaneously. Okay. 
Right, so there are a couple of corollaries and extensions of this sensitivity constraint. I mean, that comes from the proof. So we can define the sensitivity graph GF. Uh, it's the following. So the vertex set are just 0, 1 to the n, and two vertices are adjacent if these uh, two vectors differ in one coordinate and their f values are different. So now the spectral sensitivity lambda f is defined as the, just the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of GF. So from the proof, we can slightly modify the proof and show that for all Boolean functions f, the degree of f is less or equal to the square of lambda of f. So basically our proof of this sensitivity conjecture is like the degree is less or equal to the square of lambda of f, and lambda of f is less or equal to the sensitivity of f. So from there you get the degree is less or equal to the sensitivity square. And you can also, uh, uh, you can either use this as a black box or you can look at the proof directly and show that for all Boolean functions, the degree is less or equal to the zero sensitivity times the one sensitivity. So here, this S0 of F meaning, means that you just maximize the local sensitivity over the zero inputs and here do it for the one input. Okay. All right, so before I finish, so let me mention there are some remaining problems in this field. So the first one is, I mean, it's still unsolved, of course. So we only saw that the block sensitivity is at most some constant times the sensitivity to the force power. So can we actually prove that it's quadratic, at most quadratic? So it seems that people have put a lot of effort in improving the Rubinstein's construction, but so far it's hard to break the quadratic barrier. And I also have full faith on the validity of this conjecture. And I think maybe one can actually, again, use a linear algebra technique here. So here, this is my conjecture that will imply this QSC. So if we look at this uh, Adama type matrix MN, now you take a principal sub matrix uh, and you make sure that you always pick those rows corresponding to a uh, given list of distribution subsets and there are T of them. And you make sure that you don't include the rows that corresponds to the empty set. Is it true that it has eigenvalue of absolute value at most to the of n minus T? So if this is true, then it implies the, this upper bound. And I cannot even prove it for the simplest case like T equals one or two. But I run a program for small n and it seems to be correct, at least for those cases. And I think there's some difficulty of applying the interlacing here because for interlacing, we cannot um, say that we want to make sure that certain rows or columns exist in the principal sub matrix we take. So I don't know how to do it. Maybe there's a clever, clever way to get around this barrier here. So the second problem is more open-ended. So for graph G, uh, let's assume that the graph is maybe vertex transitive or Alice space symmetric. What can we say about is alpha plus one vertex induced subgraphs. So here alpha is the independence number. So we definitely know that this induced subgraph cannot be empty, but can we sometimes get some non-trivial lower bound on the maximum degree, average degree, or the special radius of this induced subgraph? So for example, if you take the Cartesian product of cycles of length three, then you might expect something similar to happen there, right? If you look at that Cartesian flow, that the independence number is equal to three to the n minus one. So you might hope that, okay, as long as we take three to the n minus one plus one vertices, maybe just like the hypercube case, immediately we have a maximum degree to be at least root n. But unfortunately, it's not even true there. So you can find a three to the n minus one plus one vertex subgraph of this Cartesian product of three cycles, such that it gives you just an induced match which is somewhat surprising to us. Okay, and finally, again, this is not a very well-formulated question. So, so this, the choice of this uh, side adjacency matrix can be viewed as certain operations on the adjacency matrix of QN itself, such that, so we know that originally QN has uh, adjacency, sorry, this adjacency matrix has eigenvalues that are n, n minus two, n minus four, all the way to minus n. So in some sense, this signing compresses the positive and the negative eigenvalues of QN. 
So I wonder if one can observe this phenomenon in a more general way. So can we define some signing on certain graphs such that it always compresses the eigenvalue? I think it would be useful for other problems in theoretical computer science and combinatorial algorithms as well. And thank you. And this is a picture so in that sensitivity has finally joined a large and heavy flock. Thank you. So can you maybe go back to the question on the block sensitivity? I'm not sure that I, I got it. Can you explain why it would improve? Uh, the conjecture here? Yeah. Okay. So I think if you take the this is some matrix MN, and so basically we would like to look at a bipartition of the, the vertices of the cube, right? And we bound the maximum degree of that bipartite graph in the induced bipartite graph. And because this matrix MA is uh, orthogonal matrix, so it will the problem will translate to an induced translate to a principal sub matrix that only corresponds to one part of this bipartition, and that's where this comes from. So I just try to get, take a different uh, signing on the edges instead of setting all of them to be one, and use the largest eigenvalue to bound the maximum degree. But now we're doing this for the bipartite graph directly and we don't apply the parity function to, to reduce this to the induced subgraph. So basically, I don't want to go through the, the step of using degrees. Sorry, it, it's not quite clear to me. So like, uh, so can you explain this, uh, the principal sub matrices? What do you mean they're coming from these disjoint sets S1 up to ST? Oh, okay, so basically every row and column of this matrix MN corresponds to a subset, right? So now we have a fixed list of subset X, Y, F2 up to ST and they're pairwise disjoint. So now we're allowed to take any principal sub matrix using rows I mean, we, we must include those rows, but we are not allowed to use empty set. I mean, this slide, you try to make sure that the block sensitivity is T, yeah, basically. And now the eigenvalue of this matrix is somehow corresponds to the eigenvalue of this bipartite induced subgraph. And so, yeah. I mean, I, I should have written down more details, but yeah. Um, sort of a little bit orthogonal, but uh, the question about uh, the best possible signing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, if you had a degree D graph, you'd expect the in, there are signings one could expect in a random graph, which are Ramanujan, like two root D minus one. Mm -hmm. So, somehow. 2 root n minus 1 might have been the limit here, but somehow root n seemed to be the limit. Uh, I mean, for some n. particular graph, you can do better than 2 times 1. Right? But for a usual d regular graph, I think the best people believe is like 2 to the school of d minus 1. I mean, there's this beautiful conjecture, I think, by Bilu and Linear. Right? So if that's true, then it implies that you can construct by uh, bipartite or maybe Ramanujan or the Ramanujan graph of degree two or just the bipartite one. But isn't root n smaller than two root n minus one? It, it's somehow better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a mm -hmm. graph, right? Hmm. Right by the special graph. So yeah. Well, also not constant degree. I don't know. Maybe maybe. What happens if the, the signing is random? What can you say? The signing is random. Mm, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it, but I don't think it will give you uh, into the C. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break now and uh, uh, uh,
uh, reconvene at 11 10 uh, for the second half of the talk uh, and maybe some questions for how if we have some then thanks thank you